Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today on the podcast, we are going to be continuing our Year of the Kentucky Woman theme by covering a great initiative to highlight the contributions of Kentucky women in our history. The Breaking the Bronze Ceiling Project was announced last year in an effort to correct something that really surprised me. Lexington has zero, yes, that's zero as in none, monuments recognizing the contribution of women to the establishment of our city, to the growth of our city, to the many social and political movements in our city, Our guests today are currently serving on a campaign to change that. We are excited to have with us artist Barbara Gregudis, who has been commissioned to create the monument to celebrate the history of women in Lexington and their contribution to the ratification of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. She was chosen from a field of 127 artists and four finalists. Ms. Gregudis has created more than 75 large-scale works of public art across America and internationally. Her artwork includes sculpture environments integrated into urban and natural landscapes, iconic freestanding works, sculpture gardens, public plazas, gateways and signature markers, memorials, monuments and works of art designed to enhance pedestrian and urban mass transportation systems. We also have Dr. Randolph Hollingsworth, who is joining us via video link from New Zealand. She is an acclaimed scholar of women's history. Dr. Hollingsworth is a founding member of the Breaking the Bronze Ceiling Project. During her time as assistant provost at the University of Kentucky, she coordinated the Kentucky Women's Suffrage Project and continues to work on this project. All links will be provided on the page of this podcast. And last but certainly not least, we have Rob Bolson, who is the aide for council member Jennifer Mazzotti. So to get started, Dr. Hollingsworth, can you tell us about your involvement and the inspiration for this project? I was very excited to be invited to talk at the Lexington Rotary a few years ago and gave a talk about monuments in Kentucky for women and could only pull up a few, if any. Kathy Plowman was at that meeting and said, oh, you've got to be part of conversation that we're having about putting up a monument in Lexington. So I was very excited to bring the Kentucky Women's Suffrage Project to the table as really Kathy Plowman and Jennifer Masati and Victoria Meyer were kind of thinking that through in Victoria's kitchen, which is <laughs> historically the place where women's activism takes place. It's pretty exciting, a historic moment there. It sounds like it. Rob, can you tell us a little bit about how the project was born and how it was brought to Lexington? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, and Council Member Masadi apologizes she could not be here today, <laughs> no but she is a council member and she's <laughs> working at City Hall at this moment. So, But the inspiration primarily came from Council Member Jennifer Masadi, a Lexington council member. She was reading an, an article in Time magazine in 2017 about the lack of women monuments. Mm-hmm. And she began to think about that, and she said, you know, here in Lexington, where are the women? We have statues of horses. We have statues of men, of course. We have statues of camels. (laughs) But we don't. I mean, if you try to think of a statue and a monument in Lexington paying tribute to women, Mm -hmm. you would be hard-pressed to find one because they they basically do not exist. (laughs) I mean, that you know, out of nationally, out of 5,193 monuments – uh, fewer than 7% are pay tribute to women. And Councilmember Masadi notes, you know, women are 51% of the population. You know, so young women, young men, future generations need to understand the historical contributions that these women made from central Kentucky who fought so hard. And I'm, you know, fought is, is true. They were arrested. It's hard to imagine that almost today. Yeah. I grew up in a household with three sisters and, and a mom and dad, but 
that my sisters wouldn't have been able to vote, that I could have gone to the polls to vote, but my sisters couldn't. So Councilmember Masati and her her vice chair, Councilmember Plowman, mm-hmm. have led this effort. Councilmember Plowman has done a fantastic job of fundraising. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we always invite people to go to the website, which is www.breakingthebronzeceiling.com mm-hmm. to learn about the initiative. We have numerous profiles of the women that, that barbers work pays tribute to, you know, they were the inspiration because they were on the front lines fighting for this right for so many years. Thanks, Rob. All right, Barbara, can you tell us about the piece that you entered for the project? Well, of course, when I saw the request for proposals, I immediately was interested, not just because I'm a woman, but also because it's such a monumental achievement. Mm -hmm. I did a little reading about the passing of the 19th Amendment, and Mm -hmm. actually the legislation languished in Congress for 40 years. I mean, that's like half a lifetime, Mm -hmm. and you think— the kind of energy it took to move this out of committee or wherever it was stuck 40 years and to get this actually passed. It took a monumental effort. And in my career as an artist, as of late, I've become more and more interested in going back to sculptural monuments. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to line up with me as what I was kind of doing with my work. Mm -hmm. My proposal is about a monumental effort Mm -hmm. and about these women who, in a time where they did not have many rights, they were able to devote that kind of energy to getting this passed. And I think the wonderful thing about the 19th Amendment is I don't think it's just a woman's issue. I think it's made life much better for all of us as a society. I think it's something that the society has achieved, and I assume that all the men we know and hold dear will agree with us that— Hopefully, yes. (laughs) (laughs) —that life— is better Mm -hmm. when the women you know and the women you love have the ability to get out into the world in an independent way. It makes life better. And be able to engage and make make decisions for society. Exactly. So I I felt that although this is a monument, saying something about women, Mm -hmm. that's the breaking of the bronze ceiling, which I will get to in a little bit. I think it's something that has made our society a much better society. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all inclusive in that way. So did that aspect of the history, did that inform your, your design, the inspiration for it? Absolutely. And really... What you're doing here in Lexington is really wonderful in that there are very few public monuments around this country that immortalize the actions of women. And I I confess that I had to look up what breaking the bronze ceiling meant. It doesn't mean that we're putting up a bronze. It means the bronze ceiling like the glass ceiling. There just are very few monuments in this country that say anything about what women have done. Mm -hmm. There's one in New York City in Central Park, Emily Dickinson. She's the only woman that I can think of in the Walk of Poets in Central Park. But very few women that that have contributed to society or contributed to the political process or have made significant change. You don't see that immortalized in they're not in, in monuments they're, or they're not. statues. Or. They're absolutely not. And that's what I wanted to do was create a real monument. Yeah. And there were many, many women involved in the process. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like one person of course, there's Susan B. Anthony, and there are a couple women whose names come to the top. But really, it was a huge uh, movement mm-hmm. nationally, and so many people put in so much effort. So the design I came up with mm-hmm. says something about these these elements, mm-hmm. that it needed to be a monument 
and it needed to say something about a collective group of people and who they were. That it wasn't just about one person. It exactly. was the work of many, of many women. That's right. So your design is, you know, since this is a podcast, we kind of have to describe it. There are five silhouettes, mm -hmm. and the silhouettes are sort of put together pieces of photographs mm -hmm. of different people that I saw across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But when I... I'm trying to think how to describe this. I cut and paste different pieces mm -hmm. of different suffragettes' mm -hmm. costumes. And the other thing is we identify that kind of clothing mm -hmm. so much with that movement. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I noticed in all of the uh, old photographs that I researched is everybody's lined up. No matter where they are, <laughs> they're lined up. It's almost like a line dance. Yeah. So I wanted that was just such a typical kind of pose. So I use that too, so that when people look at this monument, they know immediately, they don't think it's people in the 20th century. They understand that this is a group of people that did something more at the turn of the century because that's how they dress. And there's something portrayed by that line of women that portrays strength that portrayed determination and absolutely so you can see that in the in the piece at least yeah. from the the mock-up that you had done for the for well the, thank you the submission it <laughs> i think portraying strength was and the the just sheer effort that it took the monumental effort that it took yeah. is why i created something that is bigger than life mm -hmm. the idea is this was a bigger than life concept in a bigger than life movement to get this legislation passed. Dr. Hollingsworth, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of an inclusive history? Many of the figures in the suffragist movement didn't combine their efforts for other initiatives like the African American vote for both men and women, and it's important for us to recognize that. Does this initiative have a plan in place for education in addition to placing the monument? As a historian, I feel very strongly that public art has a, a prominent place in the story of the women's suffrage movement. And that includes African-American women, certainly in Lexington, Kentucky. We have a long history in Lexington of a highly educated black population, which is different from many other former slave states in that it was never illegal for blacks to learn to read and write. I'm not trying to, uh, as they say, whitewash black history in Kentucky, but we are unique in the strength and empowerment within the black communities in Kentucky that allowed for a highly educated and entrepreneurial spirit throughout Kentucky history. And in particular, while Kentucky did not have much of a suffragette movement, that is, the more radical aspect of the suffrage movement. We had a strong movement in both black and white communities to earn access to the franchise, as well as to elected office. So we have in Kentucky, I think, a unique experience that has yet to be included in many mainstream histories about the history of women's suffrage. But then on top of that, Lexington, which was the center of the Kentucky Equal Rights Association, has a long history of working with members of the Black community to ensure access to the vote. At the same time, there was terrible violence in the street. I'd say Lexington was probably the highest per capita murder rate. Dwayne Boland has a fabulous book on bossism in a Southern City, and that book describes the terrible violence that was happening on the streets. And that's where you went to vote. You went out into the public sphere. You went out into a very dangerous place to go vote. And I think we should not take it lightly that many Black women did vote in Lexington, Kentucky before 1920. And ignoring that means that we ignore their bravery. Of course. And their organizational capabilities. Um, I keep saying they because I'm a historian and not necessarily careful about the we versus they. As a white woman, I am very aware that I need to be uh, including black voices in, in all of my stories. So the idea that this monument would include women of color 
that is African American, Native American, and you know, let's just be blunt. In the early 20th century, Eastern European were seen as the other. Yes, yes, um, definitely. There are all yeah. kinds of ethnic groups that we we need to include. People from Asian backgrounds were seen as other. And they were all in Lexington, Kentucky at that time period. So I'm excited that Barbara is going to work on thinking through how to include women who who were very, very brave as they came out to vote. All right, Barbara, this isn't your first go around, I guess, at the rodeo, as they say. No. <laughs> you you right. have several monuments and, and public art projects that you've done across the globe. Can you talk to us a little bit about your art? Well, I've done a lot of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I uh, created a Martin Luther King Memorial in Columbia, Missouri, maybe oh, wow. 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was a second memorial of its kind in the country. Mm -hmm. And I worked with Linda Bolton, Dr. Linda Bolton, mm -hmm. who helped me with the language. She's yeah. a professor at the University of Iowa. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. she passed away last year. Mm -hmm. So that's almost 25 years old. Wow. So I have created, I would say, that's more like a memorial. Mm -hmm. A monument is v different than a memorial. A memorial is memorializing somebody, somebody yeah. or somebody who passed away. Wow. A monument is, I think, more celebrating an act. That's how I would see. I better look this up and yeah. <laughs> on my Google. I don't have my phone. <laughs> you know, where's the dictionary? But a little bit different. But I've done lots of different kinds of things. I've done standalone sculpture, and I have worked in the public realm for quite a long time, 30 years. I've created sculpture gardens. I've created where other people's work was placed. I mean, I've created works of art that are attached to already existing buildings. I've created works of art that are put on new buildings. So when you're working in public art, you're working on a lot of levels, yeah. which I find very, very exciting. And since we're talking about what's happening in a democracy, mm -hmm. I find as an artist, mm -hmm. I find public art very democratic in that it doesn't have a lot of the rules and regulations of confining you to a gallery space mm -hmm. or confining you to a studio space mm -hmm. where you paint and then you put it in another room that's all painted white and then yeah. you look at it. And so people get to see it for free. People <laughs> get to see it for free. Free, yeah. which is very democratic, yeah. but your audience is huge. Yes. All kinds of people look at your work when you do work in the public mm -hmm. realm. I find that as an artist very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And people hate it. People love it. You have the whole spectrum <laughs> of love and hate and everything in between. But as an artist, placing something in front of that big an audience, mm -hmm. I find very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And I've been working long enough that I've probably had four or five projects deaccessed, which means that they've been taken out of the public realm oh, okay. and they've kind of gone away. Mm -hmm. So that, I guess that puts them more in the realm of temporary, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when I started, I was working with ceramics and I made everything myself. Mm -hmm. I used to make everything in my studio. Mm -hmm. So I've had a, a career where I've had very intense hands-on as an artist. I still make all my models, but from that I've gone to employing fabricators. Right now I work with a lot of metal, and uh, this piece that I'm creating for Lexington um, it will be aluminum, and it oh. will be laser-cut aluminum and then fabricated. How, how big is it going to be? They're, the five figures span a length of about 32 feet. They're kind of in a semicircle, okay. kind of an arc. They're 20 feet tall, so and each figure is about 16 inches wide. So there's depth to it. It's not just flat. It's, yeah. a, it's a 3D piece, so mm -hmm. it's totally circular. Mm -hmm. And it will be lit from the interior, so there'll be light sort of emulating out of the bodies of these figures at night. So just to be like an illuminated? Illuminated, yes. So, Dr. Hollingsworth, can you discuss the importance of the visibility of women in monuments, especially for those who might lack historical documentation? We have our imaginations. And what public art can do, whether it's on a monument or it's in coins, 
or posters or street markers. It allows you to imagine the connections that happened, could have happened or did happen in the past when we have this sort of rigid version of this is what the white women did and this is what the black women did. And often we don't hear as much about what the black women did, but it's being fixed. We've got lots of awesome historians that are working on that, working really hard. But the idea that there was a collaboration, even when social norms says do not work across racial boundaries, the reality is when today's audience, especially our youth, see an inspiring or thoughtful public monument, that they'll be able to imagine a long-lived history of collaboration and working even with people they might think of as, as so different from themselves, but, but have a, a great common cause. Will there be other monuments for this project? I'm hoping there will be others, but this is certainly the most uh, ambitious and first on the drawing board. So who else would you like to see memorialized in a monument? I have been the author of many, many different little biographical sketches of Lexington and Fayette County women who were famous in their time period and have been forgotten these days. Probably uh, the most extraordinary women would have to be, as I, I love Barbara's idea of putting women in a group, because that's certainly how women who were politically active worked. And working in a group is something that I think we should show our, our youth, the role models of collaborative effort that it takes to make big change and the longevity <laughs> of that collaborative work. Many times people get into a volunteer situation and think, oh, gosh, these people are so annoying or I just don't <laughs> have enough time anymore. Well, these are women who worked for decades together. Yeah, it didn't happen overnight. And we're not always friends. And we're really angry at each other. And, and I would say even hated each other at, at times. We have a lot of women that have been forgotten and need desperately to be resurrected. The woman I'm working on right now is Frances Beauchamp, B-E-A-U-C-H-A-M-P. She took up the mantle of the leadership for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was always an organization that had included women of color. Frances Beauchamp was an important leader in the state organization and then also in the national. And that's where they get images of what's happening abroad. Um, and of course, you would be aware that New Zealand was the first self-governing nation to offer up the franchise for women, both white and women of color, in 1893. And Kentucky was very aware of that. So the work that was being done internationally, women's groups were aware. We see a lot of cross-racial boundaries being blasted by the Women's Christian Temperance Union. It doesn't have just to do with alcohol. It has to do with all kinds of things. Women that are imprisoned. The WCTU was an important organization for visiting women in prison where they were. it was very dangerous for them and for helping them as they came out from prison. Beauchamp, the papers for Francis Beauchamp have been destroyed, which means that historians have not been able to track her down. And many of the Black women's organizations of the time, and there were many, as well as the many different newspapers, are gone, which means that historians are kind of at a standstill because we don't have much documentary evidence. Elizabeth Faust was an important WCTU leader, and also the YWCA, the Sojourner Truth YWCA that she helped establish later. Really, it comes from a German of idea that women should be safe as they come into Lexington and have a safe place to stay overnight. This is part of the suffrage movement. It's not just about the vote. It's about being an equal citizen and the right to to your own body, the right to be safe, the right to have the same opportunities and material support that men do. 
So when is the unveiling? This August, August 2020, is the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted women the right to vote. So that is the goal, is the monument will be in place in downtown Lexington in a fantastic location. Talk to us about that location. Sure. So uh, we're, we're delighted that the web companies have donated the space, which is on the Fifth Third Plaza on the Vine Street side. Everyone knows it as the big blue building downtown. But on the Vine Street side at Mill, there's a water fountain and so forth. And we will have a prominent spot that if you're driving along, you know, Vine Street or if you're in the soon to come with the new trail, the, the town branch trail that they're putting in along Vine Street, yeah. you will you will see this. And it, we feel like it's really going to be a an iconic piece of Lexington, mm-hmm. something that will introduce Lexington to, to new markets, new people mm-hmm. that haven't really associated Lexington in this manner and have this particular piece of public art is, is a real coup. The the yeah. great thing about it, the mayor, Mayor Linda Gordon, is on board with this. The city council voted the, to approve the first $100,000 that was used for the fundraising goal. Mm-hmm. And so the city is fully behind it. It will actually, once it's established, dedicated, the city will take over the ownership of this. So it will be owned by the people of Lexington. It will be owned by the people of Lexington, but of course, funds are being raised separately, Correct. aside from the the city, so the city a, budget. It's a public-private yeah. partnership. Correct. Can you talk to us how fundraising efforts are being done and um, how people can contribute Certainly. to the project? Uh, yeah. Councilmember Plowman and Councilmember Masati have knocked on a lot of doors of a lot of businesses, <laughs> and fortunately, the response has been fantastic. And That's when great. people learn about this project, they are they are really quickly to come on board to be a part of this and to help raise the money. And you can donate directly on the BreakingTheBronzeCeiling.com website. And, you know, it, it's not necessarily about major donations. Those are always welcome. And we've certainly had our share from the University of Kentucky, of Columbia Gas, companies like that. But, you know, if you can donate $10, $5, $100, $50, we, a lot of people have said, well, I'm donating $100 to commemorate the 100th anniversary. Mm-hmm. So that's a fun way of participating. Yeah, I've known a couple of donors that have donated memory of a woman in their life that passed away. So that's very, very commendable. I had one extra question that came to me after we uh, emailed back and forth. If you could have an afternoon tea or a brunch with any woman in American history, who would it be? (laughs) You can answer first, Dr. Hollingworth. (laughs) Just one? (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, you, have you can have a dinner party. You know, there are so many different women that I would love to meet and all have very different personalities and would approach an afternoon tea very differently. So I would love to have been able to meet Lucy Wilmot Smith, a very young woman, and I know I would have learned a lot from her. She had a vision of what could happen with the youth of her day. And she herself was very young. She died when she was 29 terrible lung disease. And she was working in Louisville, but she, her mother and her family was here in Lexington. And so she came, when she got sick, she came back to Lexington. I just think she would be awesome to, to learn what was in her mind and what she was thinking. Yeah. What about you, Barbara? Is there somebody in history that what is history? I mean, are we <laughs> yes. contemporary history, too? Okay. Yes, yes. Well, I'd love to meet Hillary Clinton. Yeah, of course. Because she has survived unbelievable <laughs> moments of being maligned, and I'm not quite sure how to describe it, the adversity that she has faced and been able to overcome and still come up with a positive message to women yeah. I think she's one of the real underestimated uh, figures Mm -hmm. in the continuing women's movement. Mm -hmm. And it's not political. It's not Republican or Democrat. It's Mm -hmm. about a person who has looked beyond those buses that were thrown in front of her Mm -hmm. 
to move forward and be positive and say, give a message to women that no matter what's thrown in front of you, you should move forward. And so she wasn't an artist, but I think that in what I do, I propose works of art to cities all the time. And many times I get rejected. I don't always win the job. And many times I've gotten rejected because I'm not the right sex. And those, all of those factors have entered into all of our lives. And I really appreciate that there's someone in my kind of generation that has had tremendous adversity, but has been able to give women a positive message. What about you, Rob? It's a bit of a push for the website, but if you go on the breakingthebronzeceiling.com website and you read those profiles of the women who fought so hard, Mm -hmm. and thank you, Dr. Hollingsworth, again, for writing those profiles for us, but I would be happy to, to meet any of those women and to hear more about their stories because It is such a moment in time, but, you know, basically a hundred years ago in most cases, you you only have limited information about each of them. But it's it's a limited amount of information that really leaves you wanting to know more about them, Mm -hmm. their life, their, you know, their childhood, their adulthood and so forth. So I hope people will go to the website and read those profiles and then, you know, don't stop there. Go to the public library. Hey, we're sitting here at the public library right now, but find out more about these women and this cause. It's basically women wouldn't be in the positions they're in today had these women not have broken ranks with conventional, you know, life of that time and fought that battle. And thanks to them, we have the right to vote now. So Absolutely. Uh, and we're all very appreciative of that. And I'm appreciative of Dr. Hollingsworth for joining us all the way from New Zealand and getting up so early, <laughs> considering the time change. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, Barbara. My Thank pleasure. you for including me. It's by the way, it's absolutely gorgeous here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting us know it's freezing here. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Nice to meet you, and thank you, Barbara, for doing this. It's so exciting. Oh, it's a pleasure, really. I feel like the beneficiary of all this hard work that's gone into this project for the last two years, and I'm really thrilled that I've been chosen for the project, and I'm really looking forward to erecting it (laughs) in August. Yes, we look forward to seeing it. We're lucky we work at the Central Library, and we'll get to be close to that monument Mm -hmm. and hopefully participate in the unveiling of it. So we're looking forward to it. And thank you so much, Barbara, for for taking the time to visit with us. I know you have a a, a flight to catch. so My pleasure. And thank you, Rob. Rob Bolson, the aide for Jennifer Mazzotti. It's my pleasure. And and if I could just, again, thank Barbara for everything that she's done. She's been wonderful to work with. And, you know, we're not finished on the fundraising. We're not finished with the project. There's still lots to do between now and August. So we hope anyone who's interested in participating in this, to whatever degree, will contact us. They can find the email address and so forth. Let us know if you'd like to be a part of it because this is something in Lexington's history that's a, a, a once-in-a-generation type of event. So we welcome all assistance. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm. Or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at lexpublib.org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.